Cool. So th thank you, uh, all of you, and, and Robert as well, too, for, for the great talks. Um, I want to start like a little bit high level, since we're, we're mostly focusing on, on really agile motion, uh, locomotion. Uh, like, how do you, would you actually quantify what kind of measure would you use for agility? I think we've, for the last couple of decades, we've gotten reasonably good at figuring out quantifications of stability. I think we, you know, there's still some, it's not super clear, but I think we're decently good at that. But agility, I think, is still really, really vague. So, um, how, how are your, what are your thoughts on that? Who wants to start? I, I guess start by seniority for this round and then we can go the opposite way later. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, in terms of agility, I, I think we start to have, uh, with reinforcement learning and model predictive control, I think we, we, we see that we start to have the methodology. What we are really missing is very nice hardware platform, reproducible, such as Nadia. I think it, it's very nice. Uh, Cassie and Digit are really nice platform. Also, they have some also uh, their 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 system. So um, and uh, and and the the other uh, interesting question is that this um, back and forth between reinforcement learning uh, and and wall body MPC. I think is uh, really the uh, main road to 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 reach uh, this um, this agile stuff. And but I didn't speak about perception, hoping that our colleague from perception area <laughs> will come up with nice tools to do a good estimation of the state of the robot. Yeah. Well, okay. um, yeah. I don't. That's a really good question. I don't know how you would quantify um, agility as I don't know some some unit of measure. Um, I think maybe you know as we're looking at different more dynamic kind of behaviors we're really looking at like dynamic stability I guess as opposed to you know more more static stability um I don't know how you would you know you know you'd quantify that living on that that edge um and I guess I feel like it's also tough because th there is always this trade-off um with between robustness and agility um and I feel like a lot of times we're, we're trying to focus more on robustness um purely because like we want the thing to work and you know we want it to work on on the real world as well um so i i think looking forward we're probably going to have to be more comfortable giving up some of that robustness for for agility uh, if we're looking at you know really dynamic motions so industry side ha, from the industry side so uh, it's not exactly my my let's say cup of tea the control side uh, but I agree with uh, with your idea that we need more and better hardware. So that's also, at least from the industrial side, one of the reasons we love to collaborate with uh, academic partner because uh, they have uh, and they manage to find a way to push the limits to places we have not even thought about in industry. Uh, sometimes that's fun. Sometimes that's uh, more complex than fun. Uh, so I, I think probably from the industrial side, our trade-off is there trying to to help academia uh, push these limits. Uh, of course, in the end, we're from the industry, so we have at least to cover a part of our cost. Uh, but uh, but still, it's uh, it's a fun challenge. So from industry, that's a bit uh, that's a bit probably my message to try to get more and better robots. Rob, if I may, I have a small comment uh, regarding robustness. Uh, I think what I really appreciate with the work of uh, around Cassie and agility is that they are not pushing only robustness because very often when you just do robustness, it means that you are super conservative and the robot does nothing. So <laughs> this is not what we want. And so I think being able to push performances and robustness is a, is a key part. So something which I, uh, one notion that I really like in our field, and I think we still have to explore it is variability. That how we can still still make sure that we are we can jump from one trajectory to another one and st still keep feasible and i think there is a plenty of scientific uh, things to do in this direction rob yeah i think that that's actually a really interesting point the variability aspect of it because to me that's kind of almost an intrinsic part of what something that's agile is is it's able to be incredibly 
a variable and then be able to change the thing that it's trying to execute rapidly. Like I'm not 100%, I think that there's a couple of different aspects of measuring agility that you could pursue, whether it's like speed of traversal of a complexity of terrain, you know, is one potential metric, as well as the ability to change from like one objective to something that's a completely different objective in a rapid fashion. And I think that that kind of gets at some of the work that some others had presented on like this turning really, really rapidly. That That's an, an example of, you know, where you're changing your objective really quickly and you're able to adapt really quickly to it. And, you know, it may be a little bit because I've been thinking a lot about angular momentum. It does seem like there's kind of this something there because it's almost a change in orientation that's this weird non typically quantifiable value and then you know that if you deviate from a nominal angular momentum by too much you're having to do something relatively extreme relatively dynamic and then potentially very different and agile at the same time cool yeah um I appreciate you bringing up viability. That was a topic I've looked into a lot and I, I completely agree. And I think that's very similar to what Rob brought up that a lot of agility means we are able to switch between different objectives, different tasks, which fits into this uh, framework a lot as well. Uh, and I think all of you kind of brought up, we need to try and mix RL, like the um, advantages of RL, which are largely, um, you get a lot of robustness and things like that with more model predictive um, control or model based control. Um, but if we want to move towards that, uh, do you have any thoughts on how do we actually mix these two uh, approaches and still keep the interpretability and keep, still keep the like being able to tune them and integrate them uh, well? I guess this time we can start uh, with yeah, you. Um, <laughs> yeah, lots of thoughts about that. That's a great question. Um, I think I think it's really about breaking down the problem and bringing other control hierarchy into, into little bits and pieces. Um, you know, one thing that we always try to talk about and one thing that, um, you know, Jonathan and leading our lab always tries to talk about is like, RL is great and we've gotten great results from it, but we never want to just like take this big learning hammer and whack the problem with it and just, you know, apply learning. Um, so, and I think, especially because um, learning needs a lot of structure to be successful. Um, when you start to break it, you know, break down the problem and just learn little bits and pieces of it, um, like maybe, um, you know, learning uh, a footstep control or, you know, not, not trying to learn this whole policy that is taking in perception all the way down to torques um, and then just doing bits and pieces and then, you know, filling in the rest with like, you know, model-based planning and other things. I think you could probably be a lot more successful with something like that. Yeah, so I think I, I totally agree. Uh, so, and I think what I presented about these, um, these uh, box, uh, so maybe, I, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I presented it here, but uh, one of my colleagues who is doing um, motion planning is basically uh, uh, at the geometric level, being able to find a sequence of phases, which is a bit like uh, what you, you just described, is and this is something that we are able to to do almost automatically for inverse kinematics. But jumping to <laughs> dynamics with the whole body, given the size of the space, we need intermediate compact representation. That's where aerial seems to shine, find it very uh, nicely. And to be honest, I've seen people trying to use a topology description on the dynamics to, you know, to say, okay, this is one compact way of representing the system. Maybe this is a direction which can help uh, reference learning. But so far in terms of uh, practical application, uh, reference learning is much more efficient at, at doing this. Well, in terms of science, I'm a bit unsatisfied as I think a lot of people <laughs> by losing causality and not being able to, to know why, why it's working. And there are some people who are trying to make the bridges between the underlying geometry of the system and reinforcement learning. And maybe if we're able to bridge this gap, we're gonna go into this uh, nice direction. Yeah, I guess one really naive approach to do it, just break down a problem and try to solve it. And then when you get to a 
that's really hard. Then use learning, <laughs> then then use some sort of data driven method to to kind of fill in the gaps when, um, when you find the deficiencies uh, of the problem that you're trying to solve. Of like your model is not matching, um, or, or things are not as expected, or, or you know the the range of things you need to capture is just too big. Then that's when throwing learning at the problem is 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 really helpful. I think. I don't think I have much more to add. Uh, Robert, you want probably the, the the only small addition would be like sometimes when all of this uh, irritates a certain limit, then you also have to iterate on the hardware side. Then you also have to iterate on the hardware side. So that's. I don't know if Enrico, you want to add something. So can you repeat the question? How do we start to mix? reinforcement learning and model-based methods without losing the interpretability, losing the um, like the ability to actually tune both together and integrate them mm -hmm. both together and still understand what we're doing, basically. So uh, from our experience, we didn't use yet reinforcement learning. Ah, thank you. Okay, I, I, I can sit from, scu grazie, scusate. And, yeah. So um, from our experience, we didn't yet use reinforcement learning. I think, uh, I mean, we show it's, a, I mean, for sure, a, a promising and uh, approach. The um, thing that I would like to understand better in how to fuse the information that we know, because we know the model, we know there are some parts that we cannot really model or we don't know at least how to model. And I think that the reinforcement learning helps on that, on, on that part. And secondly, also concerning the, the, the tuning of the parameters, uh, as I was saying before, because it's a pain. And um, even if uh, I'm scared about the infrastructure that you need probably to run efficiently and then uh, putting the things from simulation to the, to the real robot. Uh, so yeah, this is the, for example, I mean, all the, I, I, we saw great things using Isaac Sim, for example, but then you need a big computer to, to run it. And, uh, it's a kind of different approach of what we are using right now, which is based on, uh, Ross nodes and these kind of things. And, uh, so yeah, this is my, <laughs> I think, um, I'd like, um, I'd like to kind of echo one of the things that I think Jeremy said that kind of stood out was this idea of taking a more architectural approach to it. It seems like, you know, when I look at a lot of the earlier RL based methods, it's kind of this black box end to end type of thing. But now they're getting a little bit more architected um, in a way where you have RL being used to replace more traditional modules. And so you know the ins and you know the outs of these modules. And so by defining them in that form, you know, you can get that kind of interpretability. And I think that that's almost just, you know, something that us as controls engineers have been doing for almost our entire careers is, oh yeah, you know, well, I have to write the thing that's doing the in and the out. So I need to really well define the in and the out. Whereas you then take a lot of the machine learning folks who didn't necessarily have that background, who they can then just say, well, I'm going to do this end-to-end -end learning system. Um, so I don't have to necessarily define how all of these pieces and parts fit together. Uh, how you best do that type of representation is where I think it's going to get really interesting for how you can say, okay, well, this is the thing that RL is clearly phenomenal at. And then this is the thing we're having this strict forward-looking model-based thing is clearly phenomenal at and coupling those for that kind of architecture is going to be really interesting. Yeah, so so the actually the, the interesting thing is when you look at Aaron is the fact that um, if you look at the reward function, it's very close to what we got in, uh, in MPC. Very often people uh, start to do a kind of curriculum and construction of the, the system. I don't know if it was the case, but for us, it, it really worked uh, very well. And what we end up is having so the the the, uh, the PhD working on the uh, reference model learning on Solo happens to have exactly the same terms than how whole body MPC. The things he got from RL is something which is converging. So basically, all the part where your system diverge and give you stupid things, things it just wipe out. And this is where maybe we have a connection between 
robustness and uh, error is uh, because robustness, if you look, for example, at Lyapunov function and, and, and the system, most of the times it's, it's equivalent to a criteria of convergence into your system. And error seems to give you a kind of mapping between your sensor state and areas where you know you're going to converge. So if we have a principal way of finding automatically this area of convergence and how we can switch from one to the other, maybe we will be able to renew it. Re renewed uh, the tools. And just to comment a bit also, uh, especially on what Robert said. So in, in our group, we've been starting to experiment with this as well. And I think one of the main things we saw contrasting reinforcement learning and, and model-based methods is we're very, very used to when in MPC and structuring everything in a hierarchy. And it's quite rare to see that in, uh, in reinforcement learning. There's usually just one level taking care of everything. Um, and I, sorry, I'm coming back to you. Oh, I'm, why do you think that is? It's a good question. I think it might be partly due to a difference in background. Um, Cause you know, a lot of where the RL theory came from, um, you know, was not applied to robotics and was, you know, for these Atari games, AlphaGo kind of things. And so those are much more end-to-end -end kind of systems. Um, and I think a lot of the, it, it, a lot of that came up from the background of the community because a lot of the benchmarks um, where people were starting to try to apply RL to continuous control problems um, really did not have any of that control hierarchy in mind and were not built really for actual true robotics problems, I would say. Um, so I think it, it, it is important to take a step back and yeah, keep that in mind. and structure things correctly such that you get the interpretability when things go wrong you kind of have an idea of why they're going wrong um otherwise it's reinforcement learning is just too finicky to actually be successful yeah sorry could you elaborate on what you mean by hierarchy so just as an example we might have in a model-based system we might have a high level planner that decides on the footstep locations and something like that, and like a um, simple, like a potato model, uh, figuring out the ground reaction forces and the center of mass trajectory. And then finally, you have a whole body controller uh, tracking this. And each one has a different horizon, each one has a different control frequency. And we're very used to like thinking about the problem by separating it into this hierarchy with different levels. And in reinforcement level, you I, usually have one higher like I, level. I disagree. If you look at one of the latest presentation of uh, Igor Mordach on the MIT series, people are working exactly on this. So you if you get different level of uh, rewards function, and there are some very high level rewards function where you just say, for example, uh, let's say you 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 play at Robocup, and you just give as a reward. Okay, you 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 did a you made a um, uh, you you score a goal. Okay. And all the system has to discover by himself how to score a goal, how to walk, run, check what is the direction. And people like you know is trying to find the intermediate layer with some level of hierarchy. So I don't think this is against each other. Maybe we are a bit too low to see the difference at what we are doing right now in terms of uh, agile motion. But in terms of behavior, at some point. I think reference point learning will have to deal also with the ERC. But may depends on the complexity of the robot as well. I mean, if I have a simple, I mean, a simple quadruped, maybe I can go with a single layer. While if I have a humanoid robot, the degrees of freedom, with multiple degrees of freedom, the upper body and more and more complexity in the environment, multi-contact, blah, 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 maybe I go to the direction of splitting in... Uh,
situation, Ireland doesn't care. It'll learn to do whatever uh, instead. I can hear you now. Um, but I, I, unfortunately, we can't test those effects on, on the physical robot and how that would affect the transfer. Um, but yeah, I would like to believe so. Uh, Robert, the last question was, um, as an example, Atrius and, and then Cassie were kind of designed to mimic a slip model because in model-based control, we like to, to use that as a template. Um, but now that we're using more RL, which doesn't really care about the model, do you think we'll start to see robots that are designed differently because we don't actually need the robot to behave like a simple model? Or does that type of dynamics actually naturally have something that's really beneficial? So should we actually still keep that as a paradigm of how to design a robots? I would have a tendency to believe that it naturally has some benefits to it. I mean, one, there's the case study of evolutionary demonstration of there's some advantages to it, you know, but that's not really a, I feel like that's a bit of a cop out of an answer. Um, I would say more, I mean, there's the high level benefit of just tractability. So still being able to have simplified models. You want to have it be a real solution to a problem. You need to have engineers that can understand what the heck they're doing. So even if it's the best, most elegant solution in the world, if no one can work with it, it's not really going to work. Um, but two, I mean, it seems like, you know, there's all kinds of efficiency benefits from not having all of this crazy distal mass or this crazy other things. So be more like a point mass. Um, I think that that just in general has been, you know, we, it's not just a matter of the robotics controls literature. There's also all of the biomechanics literature that has shown the benefits of this type of walking. Um, so, and then how closely human walking resembles these template models as well. So I would have a tens, uh, I mean, it, it opens up the possibility of there being other solutions, but I would say that the better solutions would probably tend towards things that resemble these kind of centralized centralized mass with distal limbs that are minimal inertia. By the way, if anybody wants to bring up a question, yeah, please just, uh, just grab a mic and introduce yourself first. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, so my name is Rohan. I'm a PhD student at JRL. Uh, so I think uh, many speakers today uh, were talking about uh, agile locomotion and how we, uh, I, I kind of get, get the sense that we are trying to make uh, bipedal robots that are lighter, more back drivable. And several speakers mentioned that, okay, for, for you, if you want to do that, then you need to have uh, transmission with the uh, low gear ratio, and maybe you want to have uh, your mass concentrated more towards the, like not in the limbs. Uh, but the robots like the HRP robots, uh, the humanoid robots, they're kind of very different from this. But I thought that that's because we want the robots to be able to do very precise control and we want those robots to be able to lift a lot of, uh, we want them to have a very high payload capacity. So this <clears throat> direction of having more agile robots and this direction of uh, this objective of having robots that can do very precise motion and that they can lift a lot of weight. Are, are these two directions mutually exclusive? Maybe. Uh, pad robotics uh, can answer this uh, much better, like because they the robot that they're working on now is it's it, it looks more like Cassie and less like the HRP two or so yeah. So thank you for the question. I don't think that they are mutually exclusive actually, because I mean from the computation that we did, we have quite high output. Uh, force at the end effect, which is what you, what he cares now to, for heavy loads and so on and so forth. Uh, you need a lot. You need power because you have you want to have also fast motions. But I think that the design is important in terms of having uh, 
uh, that when you swing a, a leg, you don't have a lot of mass that is moving at the same time. And, but you can still have high force at the end of factor. Um, but also, like, if, if you want your robot to have uh, an upper body, uh, arms, and arms having grippers that can do practical things, then at the end, you would end up with a robot that's, that's really heavy. No, no, no. I think this is one interesting thing is that with uh, Cassie and, uh, and Power Robotics, you start to see your parallel actuation, which I think is interesting because you still have the strengths and you can generate a lot of torques. What, to be honest, what I'm super unhappy with our current design is the fact that something that human can do is stiffness control. And there are plenty of, of, of mechanical uh, people trying to do a, a control of stiffness, but the, the, the reality is we don't know how to control them. You always have a resilient spring of stiffness, which makes your system uncontrollable. And the theory behind this and the computational power that we need to have in order to, to control the robot carefully, we don't have it. So we carefully avoid to bring a robot like this. But that's the truth. I mean, if you look at all the work that Nikos Stagarakis did, uh, failing, people from University of Tokyo with all the, uh, with all the, um, the standard based uh, robot, we don't know how to control them. Uh, and every time that people are trying to put uh, uh, a backbone to a human and robot just end up with something that we don't know how to control. So I think there is a lot of stuff to do on that regard. I mean, for sure, you don't need, uh, I don't think you need pre precision when you want to run, probably. You need yeah. more uh, adaptability, you um, compliance maybe to the, to the environment, but not, you, you don't really care to put precisely the fit at that location so mm -hmm. in in that sense i agree but for the power in general for the force uh, no i think you can have a i mean if i if i look at atlas i think it's it has a i mean i don't know eh, but probably it has a good payload and it's super strong and it's super fast and uh, so super fragile Oh, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know, but I mean, see, so think. Oh, yeah, I, I would kind of agree with that, and I think it depends on what kind of task you're, you're trying to solve, and keeping in mind like what kind of task are you trying to solve with human units. If you're trying to lift really, really, really heavy objects precisely, then you know why? Why are you using the humanoid? Just use like a really big industrial arm. I don't know. That's just like an, an opinion, but I feel like. When yeah, we're looking at humanoids, you know, we're looking at trying to end up getting motions that can move like we do, um, which would end up, you know, not needing uh, as much precision. Um, I guess, yeah, you know, power is, is yeah, still important if you're trying to do, you know, backflips or whatever, but we don't really need to make humanoids that need to lift, you know, 200 pound packages. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, like you said, it, it depends more on the application, on the task. And yeah, I was just thinking that maybe we want our robots, maybe it's more practical for the robots to be able to lift heavy weights and walk from one place to another and put the uh, put the payload at like a precise location and rather than wanting the humanoid robot to be able to run. Uh, it's just, yeah, maybe it depends on the task. So thank you. I have actually one more question. It's to Dr. Olivia, and uh, sorry if it's too late, but you presented the uh, torque control, whole body torque control on uh, the humanoid robot. So could you please elaborate on what, what are the challenges on if somebody wanted to reproduce this on the HRP2 robot? So. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> on, on HRP2 Kai, I think normally you should be able to do it because it's almost the same. Uh, Software infra infrastructure, maybe it's going to be a much more political one. You have to Kawada to give you the <laughs> access to the low level parts. But apart from that, you're going to run maybe probably in the same program that we, we had, but you should be able to do it. All right. Thank you. Robert, do you have any, did you have any comments on the, the previous question? Yeah. I was going to say that kind of from a first principles perspective, the accuracy is going to be limited pretty much 
by backlash or undetectable slop in your joints and then structural compliance. That's about it. Because I mean, the motors are going to be more accurate than a human can control your joints. Um, pretty much regardless of the gearing, I would say. I mean, because they're going to be accurate to the level of how you can energize your windings and then what you can detect on an encoder, which is way better than what a human can do. So, I mean, I think it comes down to that kind of the, the backlash for the undetected motion and then the structural deformation, which is definitely a thing. I mean, past that, it's just a matter of the control architecture that you're using. And you can always switch controllers online. I mean, it's not really necessarily an ideal perspective, but you could move your arm from being fancy torque controlled where it's super compliant in the environment to really rigid position control because at the end of the day that's what most motors are better at anyways is position control unless you're doing these really really low uh, gear ratio motors um and then you know i would contend that the measure of back drivability isn't necessarily gear ratio as much as it is um friction and loss in the drivetrain itself and typically that gets amplified really, really heavily if you have a high gear reduction, but it doesn't necessarily have to. There's been some really cool works. And I don't remember where from, but where they were like optimizing box with a hundred to one gear reduction, which is awesome because that basically solves all these problems because now you can actually use an efficient motor because you can operate in a better portion of the operating range of that motor than you could on like a five to one where you're like oh yeah let me basically just run this thing like crazy and abuse and at a low velocity and a high torque which isn't really where motors are best at operating so there we go Joe Norby from Abtron. I wanted to zoom out a bit. We've been talking a lot about model predictive control versus learning. Model predictive control kind of came from a lot of like chemical engineering that was happening like 20, 30 years ago. A lot of learning came from, you know, ImageNet in 2012. I'm curious if there's anything that you all are sort of tracking now in other industries that are gonna be the next thing in 10 years. Cause, and I don't want it to be combining model-based reinforcement learning. We've heard that enough. I want to look further out in the future. I'd like so much to have a Dojo CPU. I'm pretty sure of it. And so I, I think, for example, uh, right now, if you look at um, people who are evaluating uh, the M2 in terms of ARM and the boost that you have in terms of CPU power is really, really impressive. It changed the whole world. Actually, one stuff that why we were able to reach the 100 millisecond stuff is that because we carefully uh, used uh, the cache of the CPU. And uh, what I believe that, so and if you look at the uh, M1 and M2 architecture, they increase a lot the bandwidth of the memory respect to the CPU. And it's way, way faster. So I think in this area, I would really carefully follow what they are doing. I think for free, you may have a big boost in terms of MPC or even reference point learning, just by looking at what's gonna be the, the next uh, uh, nice uh, CPU uh, infrastructure. And for example, we have people on SLAM. Uh, I have some, someone that I know who is uh, Andrew Davison. And he used to look at all the uh, new uh, hardware uh, looking at. He's one of the first to use um, the GPU to, to boost uh, the uh, reconstruction of the, um, of the of the surfaces. And um, for example, in what we are doing, there is plenty of questions, for example, um, how do we um, solve in a distributed manner the optimization problems that somehow we use to uh, to do this high level behavior system and here there is plenty of people coming up with sort of new way of formulating the problems solving these matters and for example for us at least for me 
we, are, we can do much powerful things at the low level part because now we have microcontroller where you could put very powerful core and then the controller that you can put at the actual level are far much more powerful than what we used to do uh, seven years or eight years before. And here, I think, again, there is plenty of way to explore this in a much more uh, nice uh, way. So I, I will look in this direction, but again, I'm a computer scientist from uh, background, so maybe I'm super <laughs> biased. Uh, are you asking like, what is the next big control architecture to come out that would, I don't think I'm smart enough to give you a good enough answer, um, but uh, I don't know, looking from the, the, the learning side, I think it's um, perhaps not looking as zoomed out as you're asking, but um, I think there's still a lot of things to figure out from, from the sim to real side. And so I think we need to do a better job kind of closing the loop in terms of getting better feedback from the hardware to feedback in to our policies and into our simulator, whether that's online or offline improvement of our model or our simulator. Um, I think there's a lot that could be doing, done for learning in terms of um, how to specify rewards and how to specify tasks. So a lot of that, um, while successful, is still really unsatisfactory. Um, and so I think it's still actually um, lacking a lot of generality. Um, the lifelong learning stuff and like meta oil stuff that people have been looking into is also really interesting. And, you know, as we're looking forward into like real, real world deployments of, of robots, that's something that will probably definitely become um, way more applicable, you know, as, uh, you know, in the future companies will be popping out, you know, fleets of robots, leveraging all of that data that they collect, um, you know, to, to feedback and to improve your control um, is, is very appealing. That's all I can think of. <laughs> I think depends on the approach that you choose in general. I remember short, I mean, three years ago, there was a group that did uh, in an FPGA, like uh, plan, uh, sample-based planning, no? So probably for reinforcement learning or generic learning, probably it's better to use GPUs but I think for other things like MPC or, uh, I mean, the power that we have right now permits to, to do plenty of things. So yeah, I think in general, depends on the approach probably. But would be nice to have uh, a dedicated hardware indeed. Uh, for example, I could do, I could use FPGA to do, and probably it's already done uh, for some particular uh, type of problems that you that you put everything in, F, in an FPGA and then you go super fast. But my question is, do we really need to go super fast? Because this is something only really related with the, I mean, it's not true that it's only related with how fast you can run, but I mean, I, I always look at Boston Dynamics as an example. I don't think they have. Uh, the, last, the last paper are on GPU. So Sorry? The, some of the paper of, uh... Gates and, and people are on solving optimization problem on GPU. So. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we have now hardware that is capable to do this kind of things and uh, in, in, in this way, of course, yeah, but I don't know if we really, at this point, I don't know if we really need to go faster than this to do, I mean, depending on what we want to do, probably, probably for multi-contact things. Yeah, we always have complex problems. <laughs> no, no, yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm joking. So, so something maybe that uh, Enrico wants to say, and actually I had the same um, um, kind of uh, bad feeling is the fact that if you if you want to work on a specific uh, hardware platform, very often you have to understand the limitation of this platform, for example, uh, uh, for the uh, FPGA, the limitation of the system. Now, something which I think changed the game is code generation. Ah, yeah. If you could write, could write in Python, for example, your system, and then generate something which is going to be directly in VHDL, you save time. You are much, we are way faster. And this is something, again, it's a new concept that I see emerging. So I see in Ross, they have this working group on acceleration hardware, and they are going into this line. So that, that would be, uh, I think, and I get, uh, agree with that. If 
I, I have seen PhD when the guy spent three years writing one super fast optimization problem on GPU. And when you want to change it, you have to redo another three years for PhD, which I think is <laughs> a dead end. But when you, when you are able to generate very quickly the code towards the GPU and something which is sensible for the, for the, for the person, this is, I think, why we win. Robert, you want to go for one or? Yeah, so I can kind of throw something a little bit off the wall. Um, I think it's a lot of problem representation stuff. If you think of how we represent controllers and control tasks in most things that we ask robots to do is we tell them move to this Euclidean position in the world and <coughs> that's it. And that's really, I mean, that's not how humans think about problems. That's not how we tend to tell people how to do things or instruct people how to do things. Um, but, you know, I think one of the fields that's been actually looking at this is it's really interesting is those like the Dolly 2 automatic painting generation where you type a word, a sentence, and it suddenly, you know, creates a painting of, sal of cats eating lasagna in the style of Salvador Dolly. And it will just do it. And I think that there's something there for the fact that you're adding this kind of intelligence and how you represent the thing that you're trying to have the robot to do. Because I mean, that intrinsically is part of the control action that it's going to be doing. Like I, I don't, the way I perform a feedback task, if I'm grabbing a door handle versus controlling my hand in space is completely different because of what is being closed by this handle. And I think that there's probably something there in how we're representing these tasks and asking the robot to do these tasks. It's going to fundamentally change the way we approach a lot of it. I have no idea what it is, but that's just kind of like a, oh yeah, if we could represent it in this abstract fashion and then it just kind of figures out what to do from there, then that would change how we do all of these approaches. So. You preempted me. Um, oh. I'll elaborate a little bit on that. I, I, I think it's the same thing, but in particular, I think we're missing symbolic reasoning. So, yeah. and I think this will play into, as, as Robert said, how easy it is to learn, but also how easy it is to design hierarchies. I, I'm a big fan of, of actually doing hierarchies, right? Uh, but if I think of like, if I'm gonna do parkour, I'm not gonna think in terms really of the, or when you're learning, you kind of think of the term uh, in terms of the trajectories you're gonna try and do. But after you actually kind of encapsulate this into the type of move, and you're going to think in terms of like that symbolic movement, which is then kind of adjusted as you're actually executing it. So I'm going to think, oh, I'm going to do this vault, and then I'm going to um, do a gainer, and then do this pre or something like that. Um, and I think that's a lot coming actually, kind of like RL, coming more from there's a lot of neuroscience and uh, psychology that's working on this. And it's, I don't know if it's really the right time, but I think translating that into engineering that we can actually leverage it, um, that would be a big step. Do you have a, a next big thing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> next year. <laughs> I, I fully disagree with that one. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I'd like to maybe close out with um, one last simple question. Uh, I, I really like you pointed out how developing a new frame, like control framework takes like two years at a time. Uh, I know at, a, at the IHMC, you're really big on the agile development. Uh, I imagine in industry, it's, it's something similar. Uh, can each of you maybe say one thing that's not on the academic side, but some lesson learned that really kind of changed the game in your lab, how you develop things uh, that actually makes things easier to you know, try new ideas to actually, um, you know, do good research, but it's really how you actually uh, sort of organize the, the engineering part of things. Unit tests. Thanks. <laughs> I'll echo that. Test-driven development and baby steps. So do your baby steps with your test-driven development. It doesn't matter if you think that you know exactly how you're going to do it. Do the baby steps. If you skip them, you'll mess up.
Yeah, um, I would kind of agree with both of those. Um, like at least when it comes to learning, when it, it's incredibly difficult to debug and to know what's going wrong when something does go wrong because something always does go wrong eventually. Um, so it's um, it, it's tough to have unit tests for RL, but similar things are like testing on toy problems, uh, making sure things work. And then after that, like saving everything um, and saving every single thing that you try out, uh, especially when it comes to RL, because a lot of it is trying out different design choices, trying out different reward functions, noting down every single thing that you tried because um, sometimes really small changes have really large effects um, and just being able to go back to things um, starting from a you know a checkpoint that you trained previously, um, just saving everything is really really important. Well, maybe it's going to be it will seems to be contradictory with what I presented, <laughs> but uh, I think at the end what we are striving for is simplicity. Uh, you know, it's just that one concept that is working for. Um, a lot, lot of things. So, for example, some things that I used to say that we 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 have a, a computers and we are able to use them without knowing how CPU is working and, and stuff like this. Because at the end, the final product that the computer are, com are able to to provide is something that is easy at least for us to use. And I think we didn't reach that stage actually in in human robotics. I'll volunteer one as well. Um, goes along with saving everything, visualize everything. I don't do it enough, but I understand things so much better after I've visualized it. Um, okay, thanks everybody for, for sticking around, especially the people that joined in virtually. I know it's, it's super late wherever you are. Uh, and thanks for great uh, speakers and, and panelists. Thank you. And um, hopefully see more of you in person next year. And thank you very much for the organization of this nice workshop. Thank you.